that countdown is always so dramatic and it should be because welcome to intentioning this live i am so 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 excited to get to talk to my great friend and amazing visionary woman rupa dash today and uh, these are conversations with the most interesting people to help you reach your highest intentions always that's our goal i'm gloria felt i'm co-founder and president of take the lead and our mission is to prepare develop inspire and propel all women of all diversities and intersectionalities to take their fair and equal share of leadership positions by 2025 so we've got a lot of work to do and each one of the intentioning this programs that we do relates to one of the leadership intentioning tools or chapters in my book intentioning now as i introduce you to rupa I will tell you that she is the model for the chapter, which is the with which is the leadership intentioning tool. Be unreasonable. That's what we want to talk about today: is how we can change the world by being unreasonable. Rupa is an entrepreneur. She's a futurist. She is a woman who is absolutely sure and driven that she's going to solve the world's biggest problems. I love that. I love that. That's where we should all start. Rupa is the founder and producer of the World Woman Fund and partner in Dash Global Media and truly one of the boldest thinkers that I have ever met. So it is my pleasure and honor to introduce you to Rupa Dash. Hello, Rupa. Hi, Gloria. It's a glorious day and I'm loving your color. <laughs> yes, you are. <laughs> not, not so much, not so much exactly the bold red, but but I'm wearing your vibe. Well, well, I, you look magnificent, and um, I, I only have little red beads in my necklace today, so I'm kind of slacking off a little because I'm about to get on a plane. So oh. I'm trying to trying to stay, you know, stay, stay neutral of things that I, I can't mess up, which I am very good at doing. So, Rupa, thank you so much for being here with me today. And I'm going to first start with the rest of that quote about be unreasonable and why I love it. George Bernard Shaw said, the reasonable man, and I'm going to give him, cut him a little slack and assume he would include women in this if, if he were alive today, because he was a bit of a feminist. The reasonable man adapts himself to the world. The unreasonable man expects the world to adapt to him. Therefore, all progress depends on the unreasonable man. And that is why I used that quote and created that leadership tool and wanted to profile you in my book because you are, if anything, the most unreasonable person I know in the sense of believing we can make massive changes. How did you get that way? Tell us a little bit about the backstory of Rupa and, and what was your path? To where you are today i think I, I grew up in an environment which was so unreasonable but still i was never afraid to see myself in places or or take on problems or talk about problems or those are absolutely not my my cup of tea at, at, at my age uh and i think uh that really changed and i my, my mother always encouraged me to speak my mind to not only to speak my mind, but to show up in places where I was not welcomed. Um, you know, there, there are times when you feel underestimated, undervalued and underserved. But those are the places I think I absolutely belong. Um, and, and that's that kind of unreasonable thinking really stuck with me while growing up. You know, I'm, I'm the first girl in my family to have the highest education and and so as my younger sister so so you know coming from an environment where girls education is is a question it's it's often not a priority um you know it's an unreasonable thing for for a girl to even get education you know it all starts from there i guess uh, and and of course if you are a girl if you're going to school getting education you're often questioned like what would you even do with this this kind of education you you would just get married to a truck driver i guess uh you know or somebody who owns a truck you know that's 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 all you can you know are the possibilities of a girl where i was growing up what, what did you imagine you would do as you were 
getting your education? What what did you imagine when you were a girl that you would do? I think I I lived in my own metaverse. <laughs> I, I absolutely, you know, I think about it often because I had this whole world that I created in my mind, and I would go into it and play with it, and I would pick up different roles. It depends on the day. It depends on what I'm interacting, what I'm reading, or what I'm seeing. What kind of problems that I am I'm facing at that time. I would just reverse everything and play it in my mind that I am in charge. I'm in, in in control. How would I? What would I do if I I am here in this situation? Wow! And, wow! That, I think that's unusual. I think that's very unusual. And 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 I I I I, I seem to be very unassuming to to the people whom I interact because mm -hmm. they would always think me that I am going through this and I won't make it. I won't do it. But you know there is a power in underestimation. You know you are there. There is a lot of pressure that is taken off of you. You are not expected to do anything. You are not losing anything. So I think I kind of played that game. You know in my mind. You know, and it was a fun game. And I I still think um, it's it's an interesting metaverse I lived. And I, when I see metaverse really happening, I understand the potential. And I understand you know. Uh, how it can break barriers for women, how it can create more an equal world, how can women own more, how can women ask for more, how can women show up differently in their own metaverse, which they, they are in charge and they are creating it. Well, explain a little more since you seem to understand the concept mm -hmm. of metaverse. Mm -hmm. Maybe not everybody does. When you talk about it, describe what you're speaking of when you talk about the metaverse. I think it's a three-dimensional world. It's a three-dimensional world that that is that is created by technology, but humans are creating based on their needs, based on the problems around the world, and and is Web 3.0. But I don't want to get into technicalities. But just think about from from something. This is this is this is not. I don't think it's a new concept. It's just a new concept because we are using technology. But we all have that metaverse inside us. It's just it's just a matter of if we are exploring our own metaverse enough. If we if we if we are taking charge of our own life and curating that that you know three dimensional world that we want to live in, and I think my life has been my, the the curation of my own metaverse, which I played millions of times in many different ways in many different scenarios and. And, you know, I, I always say, you know, anything I can imagine, if I, if I say something, I can immediately see it, you know, how, how those things happen, you know, how I can make it happen. And not to worry about, you know, if somebody will take my idea or this is like a virgin mm -hmm. idea. There is not enough in this world. You know, the, the, those things does not exist in the metaverse because it's unlimited. There is, there is an abundant future. You know, you have to care less about, you know, what will be left from for me, rather than curating a more abundant world where you are playing a significant role, but also creating, you know, unique players with whom you want to play and, and live in the metaverse, even if you are not anymore in this world. I think that's going to happen, you know, uh, with the new emerging future that I'm seeing. But there, there's a part of me that's kind of giggling inside because when you were talking about creating your own metaverse as a child, mm -hmm. I, I was thinking about, yeah, well, I used to play Monopoly by myself too. And I could fantasize, I could fantasize all kinds of things, but a whole metaverse, I mean, that's yeah. really something for a child to be really recognizing that and essentially the world is your oyster, it sounds yeah. like. You know, it's like you, you you're making it. And and I, I then the next thing on a more serious note that comes to my mind and that I can't help but question you about is how do you think about people who don't yet recognize that resources are unlimited how do you how do you square that with some of the people like you know like that start wars for example which we are now in the middle of witnessing once again mm -hmm. how, how do you think we can inculcate that that boundless thinking the, you know, the, the the recognition that resources are unlimited, that there is enough for everybody, that we don't have to fight each other for it. How do you see human beings being able to come to terms with that and, and really make that a part of our culture as opposed to fighting in wars and the traditional narrative of history, which has been 
that resources are finite and I have to fight you to get my piece of the pie. I think it, it starts with all sorts of human created uh, inequalities that, that we have created in our physical world. You know, you know, in last few years, we have absolutely have got an understanding how the world is actually working, you know, where we come from, how the atom, how the gene, uh, you know, even like uh, producing food in innovative ways, you know, producing children, reproduction of, of, of the population is also, uh, it's, it's now happening in many different ways. So, you know, it's, I think education is key here more than mm -hmm. any, you know, participation, of girls education not just girls having um you know you know k-12 education but you know creating visionaries what i mean by visionaries is combining this idea of the vision that that every young girl can think about the future or even as an individual of a future that is abandoned but also having the right engineering tools i don't mean by engineering when i say don't mean by going to an engineering school but having the stem education is so key here because when you mix those two skill sets vision and engineering vision visionary which i call it you hmm. would create a, a unique um opportunity for for the global population and then that's why you know stem education creativity are not two separate conversations these are very inclusive and 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 should work hand in hand. Um, I think education for art is key here because unless mm -hmm. and until art, film, storytelling, writers, like, you know, these these have to be equally important as the you know skills in science and technology is important. And that's where we will change the mindset, understanding that hey, we have understanding of the world, the resources, the planet, the animals, the the biodiversity everything and how, what is possible with, with our understanding we are also gaining lots of power how we can destroy or how we can um you know use the resources in a more meaningful way so with this this tremendous amount of power of of science i think we have to invest more more in creativity to really visionary a, a world that works for everybody and that's equal um, this this is this is an unreasonable thinking as well, you know, uh, because there is so much of conversations around STEM as education, but STEM education cannot change everything unless and until we invest in creativity. Not invest in creativity, but also give credit to every individual who does have a creative superpower. Invest in that. Mm -hmm. Think about how you can use your creative superpower to solve some of the humanity's grand challenges, and you know. It's enough for all, you know, but that mindset ch changes with education, not just, not just, I cannot just think, I will think like an abundant human being and I will understand it until unless I understand the workings of the world and also my inner workings. And if they both come together, I think we will, we will reimagine a more abundant future. I love that you include the arts in that, by the way. So I think many people use the acronym STEAM instead of STEM to yeah. indicate that, that the arts are part of it. And I, I couldn't agree with you more. I, I, I remember, um, so, so I'm going to just share how we first came into contact with one another. I, I got an email sort of over the transom from someone I didn't know named Rupa Dash asking me if I would come speak at a conference in Little Rock, Arkansas, of all places. And I started looking at, at airline reservations and I found out it's really hard to get to Little Rock, Arkansas from anywhere. Yes. And why would she be holding a conference in Little Rock, Arkansas? Yes. And what, who, you know, who is this? And I had, there was this instinct inside of me that said, say yes. I don't know why, but I felt there was something special about you and something if you were doing something, it must be special. And I will tell you when I walked into the room and I saw the, the visuals that you had of your ideas about moonshots and how we could solve the world's biggest problems, I was completely blown away. And I still am. And I'd love for you to talk about how you formulated that concept 
of the moonshots and 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 how do you envision operationalizing things like food security for everybody and you know i mean some of the things that you had in in your moonshots at that conference how do we operationalize those yeah I, i'll speak to that but you know approaching you and directly you uh, again you might think it unreasonable in some ways but I think that's the way I have operated all throughout my life. If I have seen somebody doing incredible stuff, and and of course, you know, you advocate so much about women's leadership and choice. Um, th that's very, that's it's very close to my heart. And I, I, I have been waiting for. I told you, I, I was waiting for two and a half or three years to really get in touch with you when I have my plans in order. The moment I have my I had my plans in order, I wrote you that email. And, you know, that, that's how you open doors, you know, and knock every single door and open it for yourself. You know, don't ask for somebody else to introduce you, you or your work mm -hmm. or, or your mission to somebody. Be your own advocate and just show up. If somebody would call you unreasonable, that's fair enough because they have unreasonable ways to look at you, but you know the reasoning why you are unreasonable. So go for it. So... I knew that you would you would think about it and ask me why why I was reaching out to you, but it was again an unreasonable thing that I I wanted to do. And so I think talk your, about I think your second part of your question was, you know, formulating this idea of what is our moonshot. So let me come back to you why we chose Arkansas to do it, first of all, the conference. I think the question and the answer really comes from, from the location of the conference. Um, because I'm an immigrant, you know, you often land up on East Coast and West Coast and often miss out the heart of America, which mm -hmm. is so And I thought, let me go and explore the heart of America. And, and the first thing I, I do is I, I go to the Clinton uh, Center, which was quite inspiring to see Hillary Clinton um, you know, her work, it was absolutely inspiring. And then I, I drive to Bentonville, which is the headquarters of Walmart, Tyson, J.B. Hunts. But, you know, I was not going for the companies, but I was more so going to understand the stories of these individuals that I have read again and again, um, whether it is Sam Walton or Mrs. Hunt um, and also John Tyson, you know, so and I, as I looked at more closely, I think I, I thought that the, you know America's biggest innovations have happened in heart of America, whether it's how people buy today, how people talk about retail, and how people consume protein, or even like how we see the global global supply chain. I think the whole um, world really have to take a lot of great examples from from the, that part of the world, that is Bentonville, Arkansas. So I went there to study, uh, to understand, you know, how it all started, how it all started with one man with a vision and then bringing along other stakeholders and building, you know, companies um, that are quite global in nature. And that really, uh, you know, caught my attention. And, and that's how I thought, you know, I have to, I have to see, you know, what, what as a foundation we should be doing. And I, I felt like we are talking about putting man on the moon, conquering the Mars, that all sounds great. But I think the, the human moonshot here is, you know, talking about equality for, for women and girls is, is the moonshot, which is about dignity, choice, and, and having an equal share in everything, in everything, you know. And, and, and then we looked at what are those problems? You know, first of all, women make 80%, 80 to 90% of decisions around food, whether right. what we eat, what we buy, um, how we consume, and, you know, even setting trends around the new kinds of food um, that we are, uh, food choices that we are seeing. But also the global challenge on the other hand is, you know, the rise of population and the hunger on demand which is increasing and uh you know and, and also as families we are relying more on fast food fast delivery it, these are not good for the environment but whereas women are making these decisions then why women are not part of the innovation 
why women are not um, not thinking about what the new kind of protein will really look like. Is it environmental friendly? Is it good for the environment? Is it good for a sustainable planet? Is this the kind of planet that I would leave to my children? So, and that's the reason we brought in this important conversations to, to, and make it a center stage conversations and to ignite new ideas and audacious goals that, that can, women can solve. I know that there are great women organizations who are doing great work in focusing on talking about the problems, but we as an organization move from, want to move from talking about problems to become problem solvers or not just problem solvers, but but to encourage how can we use the resources and tools, the ideas that we have to, to, in, in, you know, to bring women ideas that can solve humanity's grand challenges. Even like thinking about the population is increasing in many parts of the world, but also thinking about the developed parts of the world, the population is not increasing. People, women are not reproducing. If that's the case, and that, I think that's a really larger of global challenge that we would see and if that's the case if women are taking you know making decisions of um are making decisions or making choices of not re are not, not of not reproducing i think it is important to also bring these women to the table and talk about what does love really look like what is the what is the future of love family uh, really look like you know mm -hmm. And how do we choose partners? Is it is it based on 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 some app technology that is built by a group of men and algorithm that is helping us choose our partners based on our preferences, or is it something more than that? And how can we bring those those conversations, uh, important conversations that are key to women, where women are making those decisions, but but are not participating in the innovation? And that's where the foundation is is playing a part. I, I would love to figure out how to, um, <clears throat> excuse me, how to get people into the mindset that you have mm -hmm. of believing we can do what other people might say is impossible or unreasonable. Mm -hmm. And ha have you given thought to how, I know you said education is a key, but when you think about that, mm -hmm. what are the things that we should be focusing on? say in our education or in any other system that you might want to mention that can help people think about the solutions instead of just the problems that can help people be able to think in that larger systematic way that you're talking about. I mean, how, how can we help more people think that way? I think, uh, you know, I'm also a doctoral student in education. So one of my uh, you know, focus areas and my problem of practice is understanding uh, what is the future of education really looks like, not not in typical school environment, but outside the school environment, whether it is, is it's a playground or whether it's a museum or it's a social feed. So um, we are seeing, you know, more and more young, young women are spending more than eight hours uh, it's a minimum, minimum eight hours uh, on their cell phones. I think I think that's the place where we can talk about problems, looking at uh, problems in unique ways. Where you know, I think Unilever just did something. It's called a detox your feed, but it is more so talking about women building confidence. I, I think we have to talk more beyond confidence. Women do have confidence. You know, it's just a matter of fact what kind of conversations we are having. If we are only if we only focus on talking about confidence, we will end up talking about confidence. Right. If, we, mm -hmm. if, if we bring in uh, uh, come to a table where we are talking about big ideas, bold ideas, ridiculous ideas, crazy ideas, I think I think that's where we will see. Oh, I think I can contribute to that. You know, that really comes from my childhood because my mother would. It's 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 insane, you know. When I look back and I said, how, "How where did I get this mindset?" You know, and specifically, I can rem remember during summer. I we never used to go on any vacations. We we would stay at home and just study further for the next grade. That's all we did. But my mother wanted to supplement our thinking and supplement, um, you know, uh, our brains with something more more than just what we were studying. But she had no idea how she would do it. However, what she did, she would go around the community and make friends with people who are, 
who maybe are 20 years or 30 years um, ahead of what we were doing. And they, either they were writers, they're philosophers, or they're artists. And they, my mom would, would, would ask them if I, I could spend a little bit of time with them. And I would just go and sit there and listen to them while they're speaking to other people. That's all. That was my summer vacation. And, and while you are on these kind of environment and so, you know, talking about big ideas, talking about ideas that, that are relevant in for next 50 years, I think you start thinking differently. Mm -hmm. I think more women organizations should stop talking about confidence, courage, and being women, being fearless. We are that. We are fearless. We have the confidence. It's just a matter of fact. What kind of conversations are we bringing to the table? If so, we, I think if we put more bolder questions to women, women will ask even harder questions. And that's where we will find different solutions. So, so in that line of encouraging women to ask bolder questions, I, I, I have a final question that I always ask everybody on, on my, on my uh, interviews, which is what is your biggest leadership lesson that you would give women? I think um, you are the architect of your own future and you, you are in charge of building your own masterpiece. And when you build a masterpiece, there is no expiry date to it. It's only going to be studied over and over again. So, so make sure you build a masterpiece that's going to stand, uh, you know, will, will, will stand in the test of time. Even mm -hmm. after 100 years, people will go back and look into your story, the masterpiece that you have built, and will give them the courage to even ask questions that are relevant, that are important to build an exponential future, new future that's that works for everybody. So just to sum up some of what you've said, because I want to, I, I think you've said some really powerful messages. You've delivered very powerful messages that can be helpful to anybody. For example, don't wait for confidence and courage. Start taking action. Yes. And, 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 and I would, I would absolutely echo that. I, I find that you grow those, confidence muscles and you grow those courage muscles by the action and by taking the action. But it starts with having that vision and the purpose. And what it's exciting when you have a big vision and a big purpose. And it gives you energy. I see you smiling when I say that. You know, I can see, I can see that it it it, it has an energetic feeling for you and it, as it does for me, and it is what has what what I had to learn on the job. Uh, I didn't get it as a child. I I was an adult, and as I as I did the work that I did, I I began to learn those lessons, and I'm so glad that I did. And I I'm just like I resonate with everything you have to say, and I cannot tell you how committed I am to supporting all of your work, and love the fact that we are working together on things and sharing. And, and I, I just, I can't wait to see what's, what's next. Would you tell people how to find you? Because I have a feeling many people are going to want to connect with you and the World Woman Fund and find out more. So how can they reach you? How can they find you? They can find me on, on LinkedIn, Rupa Dash, or they can find me on Instagram. Twitter is Rupa Dash, I think. I'm very responsive. So anybody who pings me, I will respond. Wonderful. See, I think that kind of openness also is 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 one of the definitions of a true leader. Because it, people who are true leaders always have time for other people. Have you noticed that? I, I, can, I, can I say something, some last thoughts? Yes. I think I, it's something that I learned from you. And the more and more I interact with you, Gloria, I learn how much I have to unlearn and learn new things, how much <laughs> open you are. And also giving space for other people's ideas. I think, I think, you know, I think we should not underestimate our power of being good caretakers because, uh, you know, once you are a good caretaker, you will leave space for other people to grow. And I, that, that's something I learned from you. And I think that's very powerful. 
Oh, thank you so much, Rupa. And thank you so much for being here with me today. I will tell everyone how they can reach Take the Lead. Our, our website is taketheleadwomen.com. My website is gloriafelt.com. I'm at Gloria Felt everywhere. And Take the Lead is Take the Lead Women on LinkedIn and Facebook and at Take Lead Women on Instagram and Twitter. So you can find us any of those places. We want to hear from you. We can You can find out about all of our programs. You can join our newsletter. I encourage you to, so that you always know what we're doing. I also invite you to take a look at our nine leadership power tools to advance your career online course. And uh, you can take it just as a um, self-study course, or you can take it and get masterminds with me or coaching with some of our coaches. So we wanted to give people lots of options for getting what they need to help themselves lead and succeed intentionally with much intention to embrace the power that you have, which we know you have. And I, you know, somebody who's talking with us today is going to be the person who will be the next leader of the next moonshot, right? I think that's always the case. It's always the case. You never know. Yeah. yeah. Thank you so much, Gloria. It was a pleasure to talk to you. And of course, the Take the Lead community is the right kind of community to launch the next Equality Moonshot. We're on that rocket ship together. Thank yeah. you, Rupa. <laughs> Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.